Thank you very much indeed for this warm introduction. I am very pleased to be here. I'm very privileged to be here. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, occasion also to see old friends and uh, members of my family and quite a number of others whom I hadn't met uh, before. Um, and um, the, the topic uh, is Islamism, the Arab destiny, I think might, uh, might uh, lead some of you to think that an invocation of destiny this evening might well be meant in jest. After all, despite all appearances to the contrary, and despite the insistence of some that we actually live in the 15th century, it is after all 1434 for the Hijra, we do in fact live in the 21st. We live at a time when the fortunes, the fates, the norns, al-dahr, destiny, and other occult forces controlling our lives, with a hand at once firm and playful, are no longer supposed to have the free run of our wills and of our capacity and, of, uh, and to incapacitate our clear thinking. Already in ancient times, the Stoics had derided what they called Argos Logos, the lazy argument that we are captive to the play of preternatural forces over which we have no control, and that one had therefore better neither think nor act, as everything is already predetermined. One would expect that two millennia hence, one might be able to do better. Irony notwithstanding, I do believe that the quaint notion of destiny still has more purchase than some might be willing to admit. I shall resist the temptation to speak about this in general terms, but I need to say that we now have the fates and the norns and al-dahr under the sociologistic garb of discourses on the necessity, persistence, and ineluctability of traditions, particularly with regard to Muslims. And it is indeed to the dire predictions made for the immediate and longer term future of the Arabs, premised on the inevitability of traditions, that my comments this evening are directed. Now, that Islamism is the destiny of the Arabs because Islam is the past by which they are ensnared or by which they are blessed according to taste is a refrain that we hear every day from very many quarters. <coughs> Wearisome and platitudinous it may be, it is nevertheless well-worn, familiar, predictable, formulaic, and effortlessly repeatable. In other words, it has all the attributes that make for the popularity of a lazy argument. This cliché derives sustenance from both conservative cultural politics and from communitarian politics, with their restricted horizons of expectation in which are complicit quite a number of actors. Of these actors, one would need to mention European policies in the Arab world for 200 years now, which is yielding concrete results in turning the societal model of a mosaic from a political desire to a reality. This success is unsurprising, as these policies are now welded to various levels of disintegration, overcoming many Arab polities, as well as to the global regime that, having shod notions and policies of development, is expressed in the policies and guiding principles of international and non-governmental organizations speaking for locality, voice, indigenism, and other terms of retrogressive social engineering. The assumption of endemic backwardness yields the notion of difference with a capital D as an element in both international relations and the internal politics of many polities. Added energy is infused into the strand by the choleric style in politics emblematized in Islamic fundamentalism and its European and North American multiculturalist echoes and mirror images. But of course, in addition to such structural elements, we also have a considerable body of academic and public policy discourses that provides reasoned apologies for this condition. Of these, I should like to single out post-colonialist and post-modernist apologetics for communalism and indeed in many cases for religious obscurantism. These supply a ready sociologistic template complementing fundamentalist politics of various hues served up to the public by members of the ruling parties in, let us say, Tunisia or Turkey, or by independent advocates of a conceptually nebulous, ecumenical 
sociopolitical Islamism, such as Tariq Ramadan in the United Kingdom. The very same template is used by a number of Arab intellectuals who, implicitly or explicitly hostile to Islamism, have for some years now thought it best to concede what is said about an Islamist destiny for the Arabs, a view which they, like others, sustain on assumptions of congenital deficiencies in Arab societies and incapacities for change. Hence, the invention of these intellectuals of the meaningless term a civil states, dawla madaniya, designed to avoid the term secular state. To a chorus of approval by fundamentalists. Munsif al Marzuki, the president of Tunisia, is one of the prime uh, uh, persons who are uh, associated with this, with this particular uh, tendency. Now, this being an academic setting, I propose to discuss predestinarian Islamism as sketched by a number of colleagues. Basically, Charles Taylor, Jose Casanova, and Talal Assad. In order to gain some clarity concerning the terms in which the apologetics I mentioned is conducted. This will also allow me to develop further a number of arguments that I had put forward in my Islams and Modernities and in other writings. Those of you who may have read the preface to the third edition of Islams and Modernities, which appeared in 2009, will have noted the claim that over a decade after the book's appearance, its arguments had been vindicated by subsequent developments. Let it be noted that the plural form used in the title Islams and Modernities is intended both with a certain irony, which seems to have escaped many readers, and to reinstate and encourage a critical, properly historical analysis of the themes treated. The plural form was not intended to dissolve the categories of Islam and modernity into a skittish revelry of difference, or a ponderous or otherwise distempered redemption of authenticity. Islam's and modernities was intended, in contrast, to reaffirm the purely nominal category, nominal character of the category Islam, and to argue against its use as an explanatory or causal concept. But before I do so, I shall need to give a name to and briefly to offer general characterizations of the sociological redaction of destiny. Later on, I shall need to consider what relation to historical and social realities this reduction might bear. This reduction is, in fact, the outcrop of a doctrine that has a specific name and a global history. It is called vitalism. The idea that societies are held together by trans-historical dispositions, such as tradition or the national spirit, which, despite historical change, always come to constitute an abiding and never-changing initial condition, which trumps change and renders it ineffectual. Vitalism is constituted metaphorically on analogy with biological organisms. Homeostatic entities, which might rebalance tempers and humors, called roots, but which do not change in effective ways. Thus, the idea that Arab societies, being in essence Muslim societies, need inevitably to return to a prior condition of purity after confrontations, challenges, and periods of contamination with extraneous ag agents that had acted as viral conditions in the body politic and the body social, but did not sully origins. Thus, Arab societies being congenitally predisposed to an ethnological destiny expressed in what is generally known as Islamic culture or Islamic civilization are captive to a cultural incapacity for change of real consequence. Any change is ever captive to the parameters of origin, of the initial condition. Incidentally, uh, the notion of an initial condition was wonderfully uh, sketched by Sudipta Kaviraj, who is sadly uh, no longer at SOAS. We have here a notion of culture as a prison of social instinct rather than as a field of human improvement. In many ways, this culturalism is the precise analog of earlier notions of race, which is no longer a respectable topic of conversation. Vitalism is a crudely bestial form of social Darwinism, which regards social collectivities on analogy with animal species, and the twain, of course, shall never meet. 
Now, elaborated in reaction to the Enlightenment and the French Revolution, vitalism was associated with populist nationalism and with nativism, especially of subaltern or tardy national formations, and has usually been associated with right-wing movements. It is interesting and telling to note that the international rhythm of vitalism has been associated with the downward curve of radicalism, following 1792, 1848, 1871, 1917, which was followed by National Socialism, Fascism, Action Francaise, Hindu Nationalism, the Society of Muslim Brothers, and many analogues, and of course, after 1989. All vitalist movements speak of a return to origins. All invoke redactions of destiny, considered as inevitable forces of nature, compelling societies to regress to, in to initial conditions prevailing before the fall, now called colonialism, and to invoke traditions instead of considering the capacity of humans for advancement. All invoke native voice. At the present moment, they prefer a program of what Charles Taylor calls a politics of recognition, a, a communitarian template premised on the self-enclosure of human collectivities and their cultivation of origins as expressed in traditions that yield particularistic ethics and particularistic politics. Culture comes to be regarded as irreducible and sui generis, and therefore beyond the reach of sociological and historical analysis. Explicitly counterposed to what is taken for a teleology of the Enlightenment, this is a teleology which paradoxically works backwards. With these initial remarks noted, let me look closely at the way in which the secularization thesis is considered in vitalist terms, at how this might color considerations of modern, the modern history of the Arabs, and how recent political developments in Egypt and Tunisia particularly, revolution and counter-revolution, might be taken to be the final coup de grace to the secularization thesis. Now, following Weber and later sociologists, the classical secularization thesis proposed that secularism, an outcrop of modernity, might be accounted for by the dual action of the confinement of religion as ideas, values, institutions, or rather at its clear demarcation as a sphere of social, political, and individual action, and by social differentiation. The assault on this thesis is directed principally not at the characterization and description of secularism in terms of social differentiation, but at its extent. And it is here that post-colonialist and post-modernist reason comes to assert itself. I hope to show that in the final analysis, the impulse behind this criticism would transpire to be not so much cognitive as apologetic, an ideological justification of the downward curve that I mentioned a moment ago. Much was made initially of the lack of evidence for the decline of religion in the United States, and later in Latin America and among Muslims. This might be true to the extent that some enthusiasts have thought that the decline in the social salience of religion and in rates of religious observance was a necessary corollary to secularization. But this particular idea was always auxiliary. It has no necessary structural or analytical connection with the process of secularization itself. But matters indeed are more interesting. Properly considered, the secularization thesis does not entail such a corollary. What it does entail instead is that many modern forms of religiosity, especially fundamentalism, are themselves corollaries of secularization. It is only with social differentiation and with the demarcation of religion as an autonomous sphere of social action that religious discourses on society, polity, and personal ethics can come into their own and start making claims on society at large. They no longer, they no longer being enmeshed with life and textured within it. It is only with the disembodiment of religion that religion can become differentiated as an autonomous social actor. And it is only when religion is marginalized that it can be reconstituted as an autonomous sphere and spawn social and political claims and programs. It would be good to bear in mind 
that what one might call secular reason, or to use the term preferred by Talal Asad, the reason of the secular, that is to say sociological and historical reason, is capable of explaining religion. Whereas religion itself does not have these conceptual resources to account for secularism, except by the use of the usual mythopoetic notions. In view of this, secularization cannot reasonably be regarded in cavalier manner as the absence of religion or its subtraction. This is a lazy thought, formulaic and effortlessly repeatable. Taylor's subtraction model, model in which the secular is merely the space left behind when this worldly reality is freed from religion rests upon false premises. First of all, subtraction is only an auxiliary feature of secularization, one in which activities once performed under the signature of religion or by religious bodies are taken over by secular bodies. A case in point is the secularization of ecclesiastical properties. This notion of secularization by subtraction belongs to the early modern period. Activities previously performed by religious authorities, such as education, or elaborating and disseminating a cognitive regime regarding nature, are under secular regimes activities that developed ab initio by secular authorities, not taken over from religious authorities, originally in parallel with them, ultimately causing religious activity in these fields to be no longer sustainable in societies that no longer are no longer prepared to countenance them as sustainable. The fact is that the anachronism of the subtraction model is based on a prior underlying analytical premise, that of the relation between secularism and Christianity. And this will bring us back to culturalism and traditionalism and the joint rhetorical trope, that of the return of religion as to an initial condition of purity unadulterated by secularism and modernity, a moment of awakening and clarity which removes the illusions of change. There are two volleys to this prior analytical premise, which is conducted in the form of historical narrative, the one represented by Casanova and Taylor, the other called genealogical with an explicit claim to anthropology by Talal Asad. For the first, we are told that secularization is, and I quote, identified with a particular civilizational trajectory, one which is described by Taylor at length, to which he adds on psychohistorical factors of the embedding and disembedding of individuals and so on and so forth, without any reference to the overarching Roman Catholicism of this particular position. Reference to criticisms of capitalism by Marx when speaking of fetishism of the commodities, of alienation, and of religion would have enriched considerably this attitude of discontent and disenchantment to a civilization and taken it in a more constructive direction. Yet for all the high-grade philosophical skills one would expect from Taylor, discussion of separate civilizational trajectories remain pseudo-historical, guided by the conflation of historical dynamics with an essential ethnology of the West as grounded in Christian traditions. The same sort of conflation, widely disseminated by the Catholic Church, arises with Casanova, who claims that secularism is the product of a specifically Western modernity, and that therefore, and I quote, fundamentally and inevitably post-Christian. I shall come to this particular posture of postism in a moment. Casanova claims further that secularism first arose as a Western theological category. This conveys a close fit with the traditionalist and civilizational discourse. But its meaning is very uncertain. I am not aware of secularism as a Christian theological category. And Casanova will know this very well, having studied theology at Innsbruck while still a member of the Society of Jesus. I am not aware of secularism as a specifically Christian category either. What we are left with is a drift that we can see more clearly when we speak of Islam, namely a drift presented as common sense towards identifying past with future and identifying culture, civilization, and religion, and indeed towards rendering religion the defining element in, both, in, in, in all. In other words, a drift in lazy thought. In this way, the idea of secularism 
one outgrowth of social differentiation arising from global modernity might have common global characteristics is made to devolve to an illusion and a lie. At best, a colonial or elitist imposition. For there are, according to Casanova, multiple modernities, dominated, denominated as post-Hindu, post-Confucian, and post-Muslim. It will be evident to clear-headed persons that the relationship between secularism and modernity would need to start with the latter term, not the former. It will be equally clear that the notion of multiple modernities, attractive as it is to some in a multiculturalist setting, makes little sense. By preserving the term modernity, it gives the impression of conceding nominal universality. But at the same time, it deprives this universality of any determinate historical content, and indeed robs it of any analytical relevance. Ultimately, this is not an argument from history, but one for incommensurable historical itineraries driven by culture or civilization, and all such arguments put the cart before the horse. It is an argument for contrastive histories, and this is, of course, an argument that flies in the face of historical reality. And by historical reality, I refer to the reality of a universal global history which, disrupt disruptive as it certainly has been, is not an illusion. Modernity and secularization are objective historical dynamics, uneven certainly, but with an uneven unevenness tempered with combination under the signature of a form of domination that has transformed all societies beyond recognition. Domination, first by mercantile capitalism, later by colonialism and imperialism, yielding the present stage of globalization. This is a dynamic of European origin and impulse, certainly, but it is one that has been internalized and made local everywhere in a variety of forms and in varying contexts. This would lead one to say that ideas about provincializing Europe are in fact phantasmatic, as Eurocentrism in regarding modern history has a very strong empirical foundation. There may well be ethical and political foundations for contesting Eurocentrism, but it is clearly illegitimate to transpose ethical imperatives into cognitive ones or to opt for postures of denial. In this perspective, any talk of an initial condition, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Confucianism, loses any analytical or interpretative force. The well-worn points often made about Islam and secularism need to start from conditions of the present, not from ancient Muslim texts and traditions. Further, this perspective renders notion of multiplicity under Christian, Muslim, and Hindu signatures spurious and irrelevant analytically. The upswing of Islamism in the Arab world in the forms both of piety and of political fundamentalism would need to be regarded with this in mind. Before I turn to this, as I return to the question of destiny, let me take up the second volley of the prior analytical premise conducted, as I suggested, in the form of historical narratives underlying the rhetorical trope of return to religion in the Arab world. This second polemical volley is perhaps best represented by Talal Asad. It is, at bottom, an apology for nativism and relativism grounded in a rhetoric of attachment, investment, and reverie, systematically transposing what is perceived to be ethical and, sem and sentimental imperatives into cognition and knowledge, thereby sliding from the sociology of politics to self-indulgent sentimentalist psychopolitics, with footnotes added. It comes from a side of the multicultural spectrum in which disenchantment with Europe, upon discovering that Europe was imperfect, is taken for its historical invalidation, provincialization, according to some. It gives absolute credibility and primacy in contrastive ressentiment and perhaps in atonement and contrition to what is perceived as Europe's other. Asad calls this procedure ge genealogy, 
rather than history for reasons I cannot quite fathom. Maintaining that one should break with what he takes to be the coercive constraints of sociological truth. These are, of course, constraints on self-indulgence and imperatives of socio-historical rationality. As it suggests that we should learn to treat Enlightenment assumptions as belonging to what he calls specific kinds of reasoning and not as the ground from which an understanding of non-Enlightenment traditions must begin. Much concerned with the operations of power and ideology in anthropology and cultural translation, what he does is use the notion of Verstehen, that is to say, sympathetic understanding, wielded in such a way as to yield ultimately much sympathy and very little understanding. Witness, for instance, one of his students, Sabah Mahmoud's plea that hyper-pietist practices by some Egyptian women should not be judged in liberal terms, but should rather be seen as technologies of the self. Undoubtedly true in a banal way, but nevertheless, structurally, these are technologies for the production of compliant selves, which would, in scientific terms, qualify as procedures of re-socialization by an authority. It does not bear mystification. Ultimately, genealogy therefore devolves not to historical or anthropological understanding, but rather appears as an act of historical reparation, the advocacy counterpart of apology. Having made these general comments, I shall be more concrete, trying to find my way through Assad's sinuous reservations, nuances, and caveats, which incidentally often escape those of his readers who are less talented than he. And I do this in order to get at the essentials, and especially to capture the operational direction of his ideas as expressed in their possible consequences and the circumstances of their reception. Asad questions the notion of religion and correlatively the idea of the secular. He proposes that the idea of religion is one that is irretrievably manacled by its European conditions of emergence and may not legitimately be used elsewhere. This is yet another effortlessly repeatable formulaic statement. And if one were to admit such a view, one would have to disallow concepts used in economics, sociology, politics, anthropology, and concepts such as gravitation and the speed of light. Quite apart from the contrafactual nature of such a genealogy of religion, the assertion that the conditions of emergence of scientific ideas invalidate their general applicability results not only in the inadmissibility of using concepts in the social, social sciences and humanities, but in boundless relativism and a cognitive nihilism. This is, of course, culturalist solipsism par excellence. Building upon this position, Assad proposes a nativist rhetoric of attachment. Religion, he declares, with the solemnity appropriate to the gravity and summariness of the statement, is the result of, and I quote, a discursive process, apparently without roots in a general anthropological category of religion. An anthropology of Islam should begin where Muslims begin it, with the concept of a discursive tradition relating to the Muslim canon and the practice of what he calls appropriately apt performances driven by the canon. Islam, which Assad rightly maintains is not a distinctive social structure, is thus made to escape sociological and anthropological scrutiny. It is liberated from the social moorings of its practices and becomes mystified as tradition with a capital T, that is, discourses giving correct form to given practices precisely because they are established. They were established in the past. Assad's criticism of Geertz notwithstanding, his Islam is a mentalist construct with associated performances, very much in the spirit of Geertz, whom, whom he decries, albeit shod of its status as an anthropological category, and it is, I must say, not sufficiently well informed by readings in Muslim religious traditions anyway. We therefore return to incommensurable traditions, encaged in a polite protocol of mutual recognition, about which Assad incidentally is not very optimistic, between 
untranslatable registers, expressing themselves in indigenous voices, which are ultimately affective, aesthetic, and political choices, unrelated to cognitive categories. Native voice is irreducible and therefore not open to analytical reason, resting upon assertion without recall or recourse. Being matters of political, ethical, or traditionalist choice, all voices but the native are liable to corrosion, including the voice of scientific reason that expresses itself in the social and human sciences. And nothing remains admissible but to take discourses on their own terms. Thus, for instance, and once again, I refer to Sabah Mahmoud, building upon Assad's skepticism about the notion of religion, and while studying networks of, feminist, of feminine piety in Egypt, minutely and illuminatingly, with its rituals, reflections, habit formations, and corporeal disciplines, insists that rather than conceptualize her material and turn her subjects into objects as a researcher might, insists that the, pro that the project should lead to the parochializing of the researcher's assumption. One always welcomes calls for self-reflexivity, but that this would need to be a conceptual self-reflexivity rather than an ethical discipline of subjectivity counterposed to cognitive purpose, or a form of contrition, penance, and confession studied in great detail by Talal Asad with reference to medieval Latin Christianity. Clichés, including self-parodic clichés, described but not interpreted, come to have greater salience than sociological reason in this scheme of lazy thinking. Similarly, in a long discussion of the Saudi Nasiha texts, that is to say, letters written by the clerisy to the kings of Saudi Arabia asking them to mend their ways, Assad advocates that we shed any assumptions of a singular rationality as an imposition and interprets limitations on, these, on this material as due not to incapacity for contemplating change, nor to an intrinsic contradiction between reason and religion, but as arising from, and I quote, particular discursive traditions. And it's associated this case. Nasiha is therefore not only repressive and patrimonial, but assumes a moral order of virtuous individuals with neither qualification nor analysis in terms of political sociology or anthropology. The line between anthropology of modernity, as Assad terms it, and advocacy of tradition is nowhere apparent. Now, this irrationalist doctrine attendant upon vitalism seems in this case to be tailored to an apology for contemporary identitarian Islamism. It is also one that is in perfect fit with the advocacy of traditionalism. For Assad uses the very conception of religion he decries so much to speak of Muslims in Europe, or rather to reconstitute them as such, a reconstitution that many would resist. He advocates a society of estates, of millets, albeit without dominance, a geographical coexistence of minorities in European societies. For he maintains Muslim immigrants, incidentally he still calls them immigrants rather than citizens, cannot be satisfactorily represented in Europe given Europe's ideological construction. What is in fact at issue is not representation, which all citizens have, but citizenship, which is nowhere addressed by Talal Asad. Asad seeks to represent Muslims as Muslims, that is, as a minority, not so much defined as characterized by historical narratives, embodied memories, feelings, and desires, to which one needs to add the very considerable amount of politically induced false memories as well. In addition, to Muslims, Asad attributes ways of life and practices articulated in books, ancient books. It is these, rather than really existing Muslims, that need political institutions to represent them in the way that Assad presents this case. I think that it is clear that this whole argumentative edifice is geared towards traditionalist forms of identitarianism, the deliberate construction of minorities, and specifically of Muslim minorities in Europe, 
and the politics of recognition, which involves not so much the apprehension of reality as categorization and stereotypification. And it is specifically to this that I now turn in the hope that you will agree with me that this brief discussion of Assad was not a detour, but rather a way station in the argument I'm offering to whose conclusions I will now wind down as I reconnect with what I started. I shall maintain that what Assad takes for Muslim identity or what Casanova or Taylor, or Taylor take for civilization and paths are not forces of nature that predestine human collectivities to specific outcomes or to restricted horizons of possibility. British and Egyptian Muslims cannot summarily be reduced to a homogenous community living according to books. Local voice, be it in Riyadh or in London, is not a voice of nature. It is a habitus elaborated by apt performance, however naive and seemingly spontaneous, and however sincerely performed. In both Jakarta and Cairo, what goes for local Muslim voice is the result of a recent historical development deploying much political and social engineering. After all, when signs and tokens of authenticity are truly authentic, then they are, like folklore, a medley of vestiges with varying degrees of attractiveness and aptness. So are also social and cultural Islamization and Salafication in the Arab world in recent decades. With exceptions, these are not in substantive continuity with the past. And this applies most specifically to fundamentalism and stringent pietism, or what, is, what might be known as social salafication. Identity, it must be stressed, is less an indicative concept than a performative and hence political designation. In the context discussed here, the identitarian conception of Islam as a total socio-political and ethical superstructure corresponding to the nature of society makes perfect sense. It is, after all, the secularization thesis with this stress on social differentiation that is able to account for the emergence of religion as an independent instance that makes total claims to represent society. The question of secularism is not one that defines the relations between Islam and the West. It is, in fact, a struggle within Muslim-majority countries themselves between what the French would call sociological Muslims. As elsewhere, in the Arab world, and over a period of a century and a half, religion was objectively and gradually disengaged from its imbrication with various areas of life, crucially, education, law, social organization, culture, politics, and the cognitive instance, ceding the way to civil law, civil courts, state and private educational institutions, including universities, modern natural, scientific, geographical, and historical disciplines, and modern ideas of social and political organization, including the modern ideologies of constitutionalism, nationalism, liberalism, socialism, and many others. Religious personnel and their institutions and their institutional bearings, no less than religious culture, and indeed, religion-driven norms of personal and ethical behavior retreated to the margins. Despite having a symbolic official presence, making way for new ones emerging under prevalent conditions, not by subtraction and without this yielding an ideology of secularism centrally placed. However, there was a parallel development arising from social differentiation associated with the secularization thesis. This was a formation of pietistic, civic organizations, organized as clubs, ultimately with a decided political twist, and at certain moments when national socialism became the global paragon of national regeneration of paramilitary formations. The Society of Muslim Brothers is a very good case in point. Such organizations acted to condense, reformulate, and guide religious symbols and sentiments into well-defined and well-organized channels, giving them form and a programmatic political and social direction, yielding networks of organizational and ideological circulation and a self-referential consistency. Thus, from the possibilities offered by social differentiation, 
accounted for by the modernization, secularization thesis, religion as such was to become a specific, identifiable, and independent social and cultural actor, like other instances emerging. From the margins, the logistical conditions for moving to the center on the presumption of providing a self-contained template was made possible. Religion became a program for total transformation. It was not only logistical possibilities that made this possible, but a crucial conceptual shift as well. Whereas before the end of the 19th century, the Quran was, apart from devotional purposes, rarely if ever read on its own, and apart from commentaries, and then only fragmentarily, an important shift towards a Protestant notion of scripture as a standalone object appeared on the horizon, a bookish tradition in the sense favored by Assad. It is thus that fundamentalism became possible. Now, in tandem with the modern ideology of populism, the pop and populism, incidentally, is not to be confused with demagogy or with pandering to the demos, although this is, of course, not absent. It is rather a specific ideological orientation with an imagined construct of the essence of a people now diminished and diluted and in need for restoration. In effect, creating a people or a community according to a romantic template. In tandem with populism, scripturalist fundamentalism becomes a heady sentiment and an impulse of formidable force. What some call the Islamist tsunami following the Arab Spring derives from what has been said, facilitated by formidable educational, information, ideological, and logistical networks. First from Saudi Arabia in the 1950s and 60s, at a time when these networks acted as a component in the Cold War, as the cultural and social plank of the Truman Doctrine for the containment of communism. This was directed towards creating and socially generating conservative, anti-modernist, and anti-socialist forces in the region. In conjunction with this was a policy of communalization, the idea of mosaic societies, an anti-modernist political imaginary become a political program that has had signal success. It is one which converts socio-religious groups into political actors. Finally, in speaking of logistical networks of mobilization and organization, one should not forget the role of petro-Islamic cable and satellite television and the culture that is produced by them in recent decades. From then on, fundamentalist sentiments acquired sufficient momentum to be self-sustaining, apart from the rest of modernizing and secularizing society and attempting to move to its center. They built up all conditions of social disaggregation, the decline in the efficacy of educational systems, the recession of the Arab states' modernizing missions and their drift towards social archaization, including the positive, if unofficial, encouragement of Islamist groups, including in Egypt and including the Muslim Brothers principally. They also built upon increasing gaps between rich and poor, the devastating results of neoliberal economies and the kleptocracies they produced, and a host of other matters. They built upon the recession of positivist, modernizing nationalist ideologies attendant upon military defeat. More recently, among educated elements, they built upon post-colonialist and post-modernist anti-enlightenment modules, and, upon, and also upon the universal phenomenon of identity politics, in which religion is often given priority over nationality. In the process, Islamization came to influence a broad swathe of social groups, which had previously had no truck with political religion. An Islamic identity within the parameters outlined earlier rode initially on a natural tendency to social conformism. First, as an affectation. In time, become a second nature and a habitus, and in due course, imagined as pre-existing Islamic nature antedating modernization. And I thought you might uh, wish to uh, just to follow this somewhat graphically. Um, Gilbert by a series of four photographs which will show you 
this process over a period, this one, there we are. Some of you have seen this before, I apologize. Now, this is Cairo University, the graduating class 1978. So it probably has been seen one covered head. You scroll down to 1995, we have a very, very good proportion with covered heads. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm showing you this in order for you not to assume that uh, Kyrene women were born with their heads covered, yeah? <laughs> Happens over time. 2004, the head coverings, despite different colors, are becoming more uniform. The clothing is becoming more uniform. Finally, 2012, men and women standing separately. These are social and political developments. They are not forces of nature. They are by no means predetermined. And whatever head coverings women wore at the beginning of the 20th century was actually local dress, not an ideological uniform. Now, the contrived and profoundly political character of Islamization is evident now in the results of the recent elections in Egypt and in Tunisia as well, where in October 2011, the Islamist Nahda party won 1.5 million votes out of the 3.5 million cast from a total electoral body of 7.5 million. Majorities as predicted came from expatriate Tunisians living in multiculturalist countries. Islamist forces in both Tunisia and Egypt are now making claims to speak exclusively for the revolutions on which they, in fact, piggybacked. In the case of Egypt, especially, most reluctantly piggybacked. The fait accompli of an Egyptian constitution with Islamist booby traps, Article 7 and 219, won the assent of 63.8% of the 32.9% of the electorate who turned out to vote in December 2012 on a text written hastily and carelessly by an assembly, in fact an Islamist conclave, elected by 7% of the electorate and declared illegal by the Constitutional Court. Constitutional Islamization is therefore the product of a political party, the Muslim Brothers. This is a somewhat sinister organization with many Jesuitical twists to its ways long hungry for power, and exercised by a keen sense of entitlement. Entitlement because of a special relationship to God. Entitlement because of the populist supposition that Islam and archaic Muslim law correspond in vitalist mode to the nature of the Egyptian people. And entitlement, finally, because of a long history of clandestinity and repression, although we must all be aware of the fact that the repression was always very partial because it was the state under Sadat and under Mubarak that had sustained the social networks, not sustained, but had permitted and quite encouraged the social and uh, other networks that the Muslim brothers uh, knitted uh, throughout uh, Egyptian society. Deploying the tyranny of former majority, it is unsurprising that the party and its representative in the office of president or rather its representative in the presidency, elected incidentally by a very low margin, low margin, are hijacking the recent Egyptian revolution, trying to emasculate the judiciary, ikhwanifying the state apparatus, ikhwanifying from ikhwan, that is to say the brothers, ikhwanifying the state apparatus as well as the media, using the enormous authoritarian and repressive potential and disposition of the Egyptian state in tandem with street action by party mobsters, that is to say, by brotherhood mobsters. This included at one point, incidentally, what is known as the Harush Shari, Shari'ist sexual harassment, the harassment of unveiled women on the street. When President Morsi opened the Cairo Book Fair recently, in January, unveiled women and women wearing trousers were told by his bodyguard to stay well away from him. 
Unsurprisingly, I don't need to dwell much on this, women are on the defensive in both Egypt and in Tunisia and seem to be recommencing struggles for social advancement that had already been won and whose recession you can see in this line of pictures. What we are, what we are witnessing, therefore, and what we see from the images just shown is not a predestined return. These images speak for societal, for active societal regression, not a return to something native, natural, or abiding. They are rather highly recherché, deliberately belabored by political and social agencies. They speak for desecularization, regressive social engineering working together with the spiritualization of the public sphere in which politics becomes, in the words of one prominent Muslim brother now dead, social devotions. This involves the emergence of new elites, systemic resocialization, the subversion of modern education and culture, the infiltration of the state bureaucracy, the police, the armed forces, and the judiciary, and last but not least, the resocialization of citizens and a redefinition of national culture according to a novel religious template. School curricula in Egypt and Turkey are now in danger of introducing American-style creationism into biology lessons. A photo of the noted Egyptian feminist Doria Shafiq was removed from civics textbooks for schools, for secondary schools in January, because it showed her unveiled. To restate the question of my title without mincing words, are historical regression and social retrogression fated for the Arabs? My answer would be no. They are certainly in progress, not as forces of fate, but rather as facts of politics, society, and social engineering, palpably intensifying social engineering. There are resistances, and in many instances, particularly in Egypt and in Tunisia, especially given the events of today, these resistances are very evident and might well be effective. But of course, on this matter, the jury is still out. Thank you very much. <laughs>